And what I want to do this morning is all this time we've spent now in the last few weeks dealing with individual subjects as they relate to the Antichrist, this morning I'm going to give you what I believe is a fair assessment of what the religion of the Antichrist is going to be about. And what I'm going to do is bring all this stuff together that we've talked about and uh, try to make some sense of it. And of course I haven't exhausted anything. I've only scratched around on the surface. And there's much more that could be said, and no doubt I will say in the future as it relates to this, but this morning I want you to get a kind of a panoramic view now of what this all leads to. Father, I pray for wisdom now, Lord, and I pray for the gift of teaching. I pray for the sweet Holy Spirit to be in this house today to give us understanding in your word. We need the Spirit, Lord. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn to Revelation 13. And the 13th chapter of Revelation. Uh, we just had a Friday the 13th a few days ago. You remember? Yeah. A Friday the 13th, and it's part of our culture, and I'm sure a lot of other cultures around, where the Friday the 13th, the sixth day of the week, the 13th day of the month, is a bad thing. In 1307, 1307, Jacques de Molay was uh, taken and they burned him at the stake along with many other Knights Templar, accusing them of sodomy, witchcraft, and all kinds of stuff. And this was on the 13th of Friday the 13th in October 1307. And so from that day forward, Friday the 13th has become an omen of bad things. Uh, here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 13, if you'll notice now what it says, Revelation chapter number 13, verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The ultimate goal of Satan is to receive worship at the hands of God's creatures. And that's what he desires to have, and of course he does now. This time. I'm going to give you five points this morning. These are the points that I believe directly relate to the religion of the Antichrist. Number one, a universal religion. Number two, a deeply spiritual religion. Number three, a possible connection with aliens. Number four, a possible connection with a bloodline. And number five, the Abrahamic religion of Israel will come under attack. Now let's look at them individually. A re universal religion. That is definitely part of the Antichrist religion. And what do I mean by universal religion? I mean by that that you can worship anything you want to, believe anything you want to believe, yeah. as long as you don't say that it's the only way. Right. A universal religion incorporates facets from all of the religions and creates a religion in itself. It borrows from everything that's said and makes its own. Everybody has their own take and way to God. And this is okay with the Antichrist as long as he becomes the focal point of the religions of the world. Uh, one of the methods in doing that, of course, is to uh, dumb the population down. I listened to a survey the other day, listened to a radio the other day, and he was talking about how that, uh, some, of the, some, of the, uh, some of the school systems in the country are removing the grading system and no longer have F as a failing grade that all the kids get C now, regardless of whether they study, learn anything or not, uh, preparing them for this dumbed down society, which we're part of. All you have to do is listen to the surveys that are being done, and you'll find out that uh, people don't even know who Joe Biden is. And they know nothing about the founding fathers of our nation, what it was founded on, this and that. They don't know anything about that. It's not taught anymore. Why? Because they don't want them to be nationalistic. They want to be globalist. They want to create a global mindset in the minds of the people. So a universal religion is a religion that is relativistic. Uh, it is anathema to the modern mind for you to tell people that Christ is the only way. They'll say, well, that's your way, but there's a lot of other ways. All religions are valid. And I've received a lot of flack over the internet, a lot of criticism 
when I say anything uh, outside of, of, uh, of, of the faith that we preach where I may in some sense condemn somebody else's uh, faith or their path to God or what have you. Uh, they don't like that. Uh, people today do not have the ability to do analytical thinking. They've been brainwashed. Their minds have been brainwashed. They've been, uh, they've been, they've been uh, uh, programmed to think in a certain way. So they're ready. They're ready for the Antichrist because that's his religion. In order to pull all of the peoples together, you have to pull the religions together. Now, they're not going to try to go out and convert everybody to a certain religion. They're going to pull and accommodate everybody's religion, and that's exactly where we are. We're right at that point now in America. This is what you get. This is what you're getting preached in the, in the churches now. This is the kind of uh, faith. I've quoted from uh, emerging church pastors. Uh, recently, a few weeks ago, I, I quoted from an emerging church pastor who said, we need to reevaluate everything about our faith, that our faith is our faith, but there's nothing wrong with another way. And people can see things in different ways, and we can accommodate that. There's room for everything in the church of Christ. And that's the kind of thinking you're getting, and this is what's coming out from the pulpits today in America. And, of course, you understand that the morals in, in the pulpits in America have taken a nosedive. Just recently, the Presbyterian Church of the USA has uh, voted to accommodate same-sex marriage, which is a misnomer. No, no such thing exists. It does not exist. This is something that's created out of, clear, out of the air. It's a fancy of the mind. But in any event, uh, they're not the only ones doing this, but the Presbyterian Church of America... John Knox in Geneva, Switzerland would roll over in their grave if they knew where the Presbyterians have uh, uh, wound up today. The second thing is the deeply spiritual religion. And this gets very involved because everybody today is spiritual. Yeah. They've redefined what spirituality is about. When, we preached, uh, when it was preached 50, 60 years ago, a person was spiritual once they'd been born again and was walking in the Spirit of God. Uh, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one, it says in Galatians chapter number 6. Ye which are spiritual, restore such in one. A spiritual man is a man who has the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within him. But today, in this relativistic society, this relativistic culture, where it's, it's, it's a cafeteria line religion, then everybody has their own spirituality because they look within themselves for that spirituality. It's God within them. It's the New Age movement now uh, blossoming in full bloom for everybody to see. Everybody's spiritual today. So being spiritual, then they can therefore make their own decisions about what part they want from this religion, what part they want from that religion, what part they want from this. Spiritual manifestations are on the rise. Mary is appearing all over the world. When I say Mary, put it in quotation marks. Not the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, but a, but a satanic apparition. And the most, uh, starting with the famous apparition of Fatima, Portugal, back in the early 1900s when she appeared, quote unquote she, appeared to these young children and uh, began to give prophecies. That's Fatima. It's quite a remarkable thing that Fatima was the daughter of Muhammad, a Muslim. And the name Fatima crosses the line, therefore between Catholic and the Muslim. But in any event, spirit manifestations are taking place. Kids are walking up the wall backwards. Kids are being demon-possessed and elevating, defying the laws of physics. These are the kind of things that are going on all the time. Manifestations of fire that appears, portals that are being entered into. Spirit manifestations in all kinds of ways are coming down. Just get ready, it's starting, it's starting. And these spirit manifestations will be used by the Antichrist to bolster his doctrine and his preaching. The Bible says in Revelation 13 that the false prophet has, has power to call fire down from heaven. And that he has power to make the image of the beast speak, to give it, uh, to animate it, to give it life, to give it the appearance of life. How far he goes with that, I don't know. What you must always keep in mind is 2 Thessalonians 2 that says, He that letteth will let till be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit of God is holding back like the little boy with his finger in the dike. He's holding the flood back because the floodgates will open wide. And when they do, be ready because this world has never seen anything like it's going to see. Revelation chapter number uh, 9, I think it is, it talks about 
the uh, uh, the 16, I, I forget where it is, where the bottomless pit opens up. What chapter is that in Revelation? My mind's gone blank. And these creatures come up out of the bottomless pit and come up out of on the earth. Uh, this is real. This is going to happen. They're hideous creatures. They're not, they're not human. They're not animal. They're hideous. And they're spirit representations of what's going on all around us right now. So we are in the midst of, a, of, of an onslaught of spiritual manifestations. Uh, for example, uh, the UFO phenomenon, uh, unidentified flying objects. When our, when our fighter, when our, when our pilots were flying over Germany and Europe in World War II, they encountered so many of them, they called them foo fighters or foo appearances. Uh, they called them that because they saw so many of them and they absolutely defied uh, explanation. These have been showing up since 1947 when the gates began to open up at Roswell, New Mexico. This thing came down and crashed and the first reports from it was that it's an alien craft of some kind and there are bodies here. And then the U.S. Air Force revised its statement within 24 to 48 hours and said it was a weather balloon. And then the United States Air Force started what's called Operation Blue Book which was, which was designed to, to make an extensive investigation into the UFO phenomenon. But the bottom line is, it is an extensive, it's an ex extensive attempt to cover up what happens in the UFO world. UFOs are real, but it's not from the aliens in outer space. It's from inner space, <laughs> from spirit beings. They're real, folks. Most people that live in the flesh don't have a clue what it is to come in contact with the spirit. When you come in contact with the Spirit, it will do something to you that will change your life, whether it's the Holy Ghost or an unholy ghost. It will affect you for the rest of your life. So, deeply spiritual religion, and this is exactly where we are today, and this is exactly where Satan wants them to be. Then there's the possible connection with aliens that I just mentioned to you a moment ago about the UFO phenomenon, uh, the unidentified flying objects. For example, in 19 and 40, uh, 48, 47, 48, somewhere along in there, a task force was sent to the Antarctica. And Admiral Byrd, who's the one who, who, uh, who's one of the heroes of this country, was in charge of that task force. He went to, uh, ostensibly, they went down there. On the surface, they went down there to, to, to measure uh, Antarctica's, uh, let's do some scientific surveys, this and that and so forth. Why did they need 5,000 troops? Why did, they need to, why did they need all these ships to go down there? Do you know why? Because they thought that the Nazis had a base in the Antarctica. Yeah. They thought the Nazis had a base down there that after World War II they had, moved their, they had moved their technology and a lot of their stuff to Antarctica and they went down there to, to examine what was going on. And here's what Byrd said. This is important. Admiral Byrd said this. He said he saw fighters appear that could move in un, un, unbelievable speed. He said, the next war, he said, you better get ready to fight against fighters that can move from the South Pole to the North Pole in blazingly fast speed. And he wrote a diary. And there's a big controversy to this day about the diary of Admiral Byrd. If you get home this afternoon, just take a little bit of time, type it into, your, into Google. Type in the diary of Admiral Byrd. First off, some will, say it doesn't, some, some will say it's a total fabrication, but others will say, no, no, not so quick. He may very well have written this. And then those who say, well, he did write it, but he's a madman. He's insane, see. And on and on it goes. What happened, preacher? They had an encounter with the spirit world. That's what happened. And all in the world, all of that is, is a preview of what's coming. But now here's the twist on that. This is the part, this is the twist on it. This, this is the take on it that is sinister. And you say, what is that? Because you were taught, and I was taught in school, that we evolved. We evolved. Biological evolution, all right? Evolution now is in three strains. Biological evolution, social evolution, and spiritual evolution. Each one of them have a very important part to play in the culture of America. Social engineers are doing everything they can to brainwash this, this culture into accepting the idea of social and spiritual evolution. They've already accepted biological evolution. You know, they've already accepted that. that. That's mainstream. 
If you say anything today about biological evolution, you're a kook. You're considered a nutball, you know, and, and you know, no longer, don't listen to them anymore. They're stupid. They're not educated. You can't be educated and not believe in evolution. That is the prevailing philosophy. All right, even though thousands of reputable scientists have absolutely rejected the doctrine of uh, biological evolution, it's still, it's still the mantra that's preached every day in the school system. But here's the point. So from that springboard, they move into social evolution. For example, eugenics in the latter part of the 1900s, 1800s, first part of the 1900s, a movement was afoot to, uh, you ought to do, what you ought to do is read a little bit about what, uh, what some of the people thought in the, in the 1800s about the races. You ought to read some of it. And I told you that Margaret Sanger was the, was the, was the grandmother of, uh, was the mother of, uh, of the Planned Parenthood. And I've told you how that Planned Parenthood is all over the country, and it's especially in neighborhoods where, where, uh, where black folks live. And that the, last, the latest statistic to come out of Washington, D.C. is that six out of every 10 children, uh, little black children, are aborted. That's pretty bad. All right, why? Don't you think there may be an agenda behind this? She taught when she started Planned Parenthood in the early 1900s that, that certain classes and races of people are useless eaters. And what's the point? The point is that Adolf Hitler took it to its extreme. And he said, all right, we're going to be, we are a race of supermen. And so there, we trace our heritage back to Atlantis. One of the root race theories of Madame Blavatsky's theosophy. We trace our lineage back to them. We are purebred supermen. So it's up to us to rid the world of these, of these, of these lesser races, of these uh, not just African American, but also uh, Indian and uh, other groups, and get rid of these people because they're not fit to live. And so, therefore, they bought into this theory, this root race theory, and this theosophical theory of Madame Blavatsky. I'm reading a book right now written by a man who was hung at the end of World War II, and he was one of the prime architects of the of the, of the racial theory of, of Nazi Germany in World War II. He was one of the minds behind it. And the title of his book is Tracking the Jew, Tracking the Jew Throughout the Ages. And he goes all the way back into the Old Testament and then he starts there and he tracks the Jew all the way up to the present. And his present was 1938, 39 when, when he wrote the book. I can't think of his name right now, I wish I could. But, uh, I just started reading his book the other day, and the reason I did is because the next thing I'm going to do in here, Lord willing, when I finish up with this, is the Jew. The Jew. If you get the Jew right, you got the New Testament right. If you get the Jew right, you got your eschatology right. If you get the Jew right, you've got your place in the world as a Gentile right. But you got to get the Jew right. And you'd be amazed, folks, at how many people don't have the Jew right. And you'd be amazed at how many people hate the Jews. And how many people blame the Jews for all the troubles of the world? And this man, of course, was one of them. But I want to see what he, how he thought. I want to see his take on it. I want to see his perspective and what he uses as facts to back up where he's coming from, his position. So, uh, so, so there we are. Social evolution is where you're at today, all right? You are in, you are in a, you, 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 a, the world has been socially evolving, all right? You get all, these one complements the other. And the last one is spiritual evolution. Now here's where the sinister part comes in. There are many men with IQs over 160 that believe that you are a transplant on this earth from a higher intelligence above us. That we were put here, transpermia is one of the terms for it, and we were put here by a, an advanced intelligence and we are either an experimental farm down here or they're just watching us for amusement or they've got something going on down here that we're not fully aware of. But we are evolving spiritually to the point now where they can come and communicate more with us. See, we've evolved to the point now spiritually to where we can receive and accept the message they have for us. So therefore, the message from above, the stars, what's up there, coming down to us now, we've come to the point now where we can receive this message from them. It wouldn't surprise me one bit 
if the Antichrist, when he shows up, doesn't say, I'm from up there, and you've finally gotten to the point now where you can appreciate who I am, and now fall down and worship me, and they'll fall down and they'll worship him. That wouldn't surprise me one bit. There's a lot of possible scenarios that can be played out when it comes to this. But make no mistake about it, folks, don't ever believe that UFOs and contact with so-called aliens, and they're not alien folks, they're demons, but so-called contact with these things is, is a farce. No, it is a reality. It is a reality more real than the lives of most people who live for nothing but the flesh. Hedonist, hedonism. Hedonism in all its glory. What's hedonism? Hedonism is eat, drink, and be merry, feed the flesh. That's what it's all about. When you die, you die like a dog, and that's it. Unless you've got enough money to, what is it called, cryogenics, where they can take your body and put it up and, and, and freeze you down to, what, two or 300 degrees below zero <laughs> somewhere uh, and, and keep you around until one day they've got enough technology to where they can resurrect you and bang. But here's the latest take on that. I saw this a couple of days ago. <laughs> and that is that they're going to they're, they're, they're going to they're going to try to dump out dump all of the knowledge dump the whole the knowledge banks of the brain into a robot and therefore you can extend your life through that robot because since it's got your brain and everything that you think and your identity and all of that you can just live on forever in robot all you got to do is get greased up every once in a while <laughs> a tune up and something like that and you're in good shape <laughs> If an arm wires out, just go get plugged into a new one and you're in good shape. You live forever. You think men want to live forever? You better believe they do. Yes, they do. Yeah, you better believe they do. So aliens are showing up now and they're, and, and they're in your face with it and in a way they weren't before. And, uh, and it's coming on. It's like the floodgates are opening and all this stuff is going to dovetail. All of a sudden it's going to come, bang! It comes together and people. some people, you know, are just... Where'd all this come from? I didn't know this was happening. And it's, and it's happening right now underneath you, everywhere you turn. It's all over the place. Uh, I believe this is true. I believe that the Holy Spirit is appearing uh, in the way he chooses through conviction to many Muslims. And he's converting them. And they're being saved. And the reason I say that is because I've read their testimony. And the testimony witnesses to the truth. And if they have been born again, if they've truly been born again, then you know it, folks. They're your brother and sister in Christ. Always keep this in mind. God knows what God's going to do, and God's going to do it exactly when he gets ready to do it. Ain't nobody going to stop him. Amen. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Amen. So, uh, possible connection with aliens. The Age of Aquarius, uh, sung by Hare. You remember the musical group Hare? Uh, back in, the, when was it it showed up? When did they start with that? 70s? Somewhere in there, 70s. You know, the flower children of the 60s. Fifth Dimension, that's exactly right. The Fifth Dimension. That's the name of the group, the Fifth Dimension. Aquarius. Now, what's Aquarius? It's one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. It's the water bearer. It is the ushering in of a new age. Therefore, the new age movement. See, all this stuff is coming together. Are we at the age then when this is ready to, to, to manifest itself? Yes. Yes, we are. Yeah. Can't you feel it in your bones that something's going on? I would never have thought this country would have, this country hasn't, of course. The present leadership has turned against Israel. Israel knows they have a lot of friends in this country. They know that. No, no, no doubt. Benjamin Netanyahu's got an IQ of over 160. He's no fool. He knows that the fellow up there in the White House will be gone in a couple of years. Hallelujah. Thank God. I'll be glad when that day comes. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> Good, I'll, I'll, I'll go up there and drive him to wherever he wants to go. <laughs> Pay his way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hope he has a good retirement. <laughs> yes, sir, buddy. <laughs> I'll be glad when that day comes. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> the heavens are about to explode with marvelous wonders. Uh, just a simple reading of Revelation 13 will show you that, but the Lord talked about it in Matthew 24. <laughs> he talked about the heavens. He talked about the, the manifestation in the heavens. Oh, boy, did he ever, and that's about to happen. Then there's a possible connection with the bloodline. I told you I've talked about the Merovingian bloodline. We've talked about the Priory of Zion. We've talked about how that Mary Magdalene, uh, Isis became Mary Magdalene, and how the and the French cathedrals that were built in the 1200s, especially the Cathedral of Chartres in France, 
that has this, uh, uh, this uh, telluric power that's moving underneath the ground, the electrical current that's, that's right under the surface of the ground, how that they can go into this cathedral and they have these labyrinths. And I've talked about how the labyrinth today, you can find the labyrinth when you go into, these, uh, into, a lot of the, into the emerging church movement, into a lot of the spirituality of today. They lack labyrinths. And the labyrinth is a thing that you go into and you move around through different places and you have different places you stop and you have this spiritual uh, experience that takes place. And as you pre progress through it, you're progressing spiritually and you have manifestations and communications from God and what have you. Well, this was over there in the, in the floor, in, in, the, in the cathedrals. It's over there, right there, been there for hundreds of years. So none of this stuff is new. But these cathedrals are connected with a bloodline. They're connected with a bloodline, supposedly, between the Lord Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. As I said to you when I mentioned it the first time, it's pure blasphemy. Amen. 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 If you know anything about the New Testament, you know that that's a bunch of garbage. But anyway, they don't. They trace their bloodline all the way back to the Davidic kingdom, to the throne of David. They trace it all the way back into the Old Testament. And they therefore say by that that they are, they are fully qualified to rule over the earth. And that when the time comes, now I didn't give you this because there's so much material to cover and there's no way you can get it all in. They're telling people that they have proof positive in artifacts that uh, when, they, when, they show these, when they show these artifacts that it will absolutely destroy Christianity as you know it today. They're going to show it. They're going to open it up. And when they do it, of course, they're going to open it up and they're, and they're going to do it as they coincide with the revelation of the bloodline. Now, what could they possibly show us? If they had the body of Christ, you'd known that a long time ago. If you had the body of Christ, the Jews would have paraded it through the streets of Jerusalem like you wouldn't believe. Because if they'd had the body of Christ, that absolutely would, would have destroyed the resurrection. And they can't, you can't find it. It's nowhere in history. It's not in the Talmud. It's not in the, uh, in the Kabbalah. It's nowhere to be found. It's Zohar or any of the other writings of Judaism. There's not one word about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe me, that would be the first order. If they could find his body, then it's finished. No resurrection, then you're... Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then what? See, no resurrection. Resurrection is the heart and soul of our faith. If Christ be not risen, then you, you're not saved. You're not born again. Your sins aren't forgiven. Your loved ones are dead. And, and you know, you have no hope. But now he said, is Christ risen from the dead? And become the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits. Everything in its order. So they can't, do, they can't produce that. They can't produce his body. So what will they produce? Some kind of a document? Some kind of a testimony from the first century? <coughs> what will they produce? I'm not one bit worried about it. Are you? No. Not one bit. Not one whit. But the world is going to get a good taste of what's going on. Now, you've ever heard the Shroud of Turin? All right. Kept in Turin, Italy. It went through a fire. It's been, uh, they've taken it and subjected it to carbon-14. There's a lot of controversy about it. Scientists don't agree among themselves. Uh, there's a lot to be said uh, for and against the Shroud of Turin. One of the, biggest, uh, one of the biggest enigmas about the Shroud of Turin is this. How did that image get burned into that cloth or however it was put into that cloth? And the image is a negative, not a positive. How did that happen? And that's, that's, uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the mysteries. That's a mystery. Do I believe the Shroud of Turin was the actual burial cloth of our Lord Jesus Christ? I tend not to believe it, no. Because of what the Bible says, that he was wrapped, not a, not a shroud. He was wrapped. And when she went into the tomb, she saw the cloth wrapped, that had been wrapped, no. And if it's, and if it's the genuine, uh, if it's a genuine article, it has to date back to 2000, uh, 2,000 years, no. But I believe it's real. I believe it's real. It doesn't have to be the real cloth Christ was buried in, but I believe it's real. I believe the Shroud of Turin was produced by some kind of a supernatural power that men absolutely cannot explain and they cannot reproduce. And they've tried to reproduce it and they cannot reproduce it. In plainer words, it may be a foretaste of what's to come. 
get ready for when Satan unleashes his power. Was he not able to cause a, a, a serpent to appear over there in front of Pharaoh? Could not the magicians uh, mimic many of the things that Mo Moses and Aaron did? Absolutely. Did not Satan say to our Lord Jesus Christ, all the kingdoms of the world are mine and I can give you them? He showed them all the kingdoms in the world in a moment of time? Absolutely. The Lord did not call him a liar. What Satan was saying was legitimate because he had that power. Why? He's the God of this world. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is a very important study in the Bible. Sure, he had that power. Does he have power to give power to those who sell their soul to him so that they can uh, profit in this world? Uh, one of the, uh, who was it? I think it was one of the Rolling Stones or somebody not too long ago. I read their, I heard, listened and read their testimony. And uh, they weren't testifying for Christ. Their testimony was, the, the interviewer said, well, how did, what do you attribute your success? He looked at him, kind of laughed. He said, don't you know? He said, no. He said, Satan. He said, I sold my soul to Satan. And the interviewer, of course, didn't believe it. But the one who said it did. And a lot of people have sold their soul to Satan. Can he give you power? Can he give you riches? Can he give you authority? Yes, he can. He has that ability. So, uh, the possible connection with aliens and then the bloodline, but the message of the bloodline and the message of all of it is still the same. Unity. And then finally, this one. And this is important. <coughs> the Abrahamic religion of Israel will come under attack. And when I say Abrahamic religion, what, is that, what does that mean? That means immediately it has no connection with Hinduism. You go back to original Brahmism. Brahmism is the granddaddy of Hinduism. From Brahmism came Buddhism. And from Brahmism and Buddhism came Hinduism, which is the modern religion of India along with Buddhism. I don't know which is which. I don't know which has more Buddhists are everywhere. I don't know which. I don't know whether you got more Hindus than Buddhists or Buddhists than Hindus. I don't know, but you've got plenty of both of them, and they both came from Brahmism. That is an entirely foreign, separate religion from the Abrahamic religion. Say, so why do you mention that? Because it's so old. It's so ancient. If you want to go back and trace the origins of of, of religions, then you go back and trace that one because it goes back thousands. It predates Zoroastrianism by thousands of years is Brahmism. But Abraham was 1,900 years ago. Almost 4,000 years ago, God appeared to Abraham and told him to take his son to the top of Moriah and offer him there. When Job wrote the book of Job, which was one, he's a contemporary of Abraham. I don't know who wrote Job, but Job's book refers to about 1,900 B.C., same period, same time period. And the book of Job is talking about the same God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So what did, what, where did the knowledge of that God come from? The knowledge of that God came from Noah, then Shem, not Japheth or Ham, but Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So therefore, Japheth is the Gentile, not us. You go back and you trace the origin of that faith and the origin of that will take you back to Abraham, Shem, Noah, Adam. Therefore, the, the, the movement of the truth of God and the truth of who he is is from Adam to Shem, uh, from Adam to Noah to Shem and to Abraham. You can trace that in Genesis. And the reason I say this is so important is because where did God call Abraham from? That's right. He called him out of it, from it. He called him from Ur of the Chaldees. What is the Chaldees? The Chaldees is a religion that was centered in Babylonia. All right. And you can go back and you can trace Babylon to Nimrod. These are ancient religions. They show up a long time ago. So immediately in the Bible, you've got two sources, two, two lines of understanding and knowledge. And only one of them is the knowledge and understanding of the true and living God, the Abrahamic religion. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the Old Testament Jew had the truth of the true and living God. That's what I'm saying. 
regardless of what, uh, I wish I could think of his name, regardless of this Nazi uh, philosopher uh, uh, and what he has to say about tracking the Jew through time, uh, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the source of truth, and the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob led directly to the creation of the New Testament. The New Testament is a product of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, here's what's so important about this. The Abrahamic religion is a monotheistic religion. That's a big word that simply means one God. One God. One God. There's no place for one God under the Antichrist. No place. If you've got a million gods or a million and 500,000, fine, they didn't care. It's like the Romans. They didn't care how many gods you had as long as the, as, as, as the, as the, as, as the Roman, uh, 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 what's he called? Caesar. Caesar. As long as the Roman Caesar is the Pontifus Maximus or the supreme leader, his religion, all that. If you accept that, he can care what you believe. All right. One God. The Christian believes in the one God, Deuteronomy 6, 4, of the Abrahamic religion, and they believe in one Savior of mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Neither is there salvation in any other, Amen. nor the name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That condemns us. That condemns the Christian, and that condemns the Jew in this relativistic, uh, plural uh, society, pluralism, where every God, no matter whose God it is, all of them are valid ways. That condemns us. Here's where we're spared. Thanks be unto God. He said in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, He hath not appointed you to wrath. Do you know what that wrath is in 1 Thessalonians 5? It's not hell. No, but to obtain salvation. In plainer words, deliverance before the wrath of God, which is the tribulation period. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Notice, Jacob's trouble. The Jew is going to have to suffer. That Abrahamic part will have to suffer for uh, into the tribulation period at the hands of the Antichrist because of their faith in one God. They'll pay for it, pay for it dearly. We, thank God, will be gone because we're his bride. We not only are of the Abrahamic religion, I am absolutely 100% of the Abrahamic religion, but I am a member of the body of Christ, and he's going to come and get his bride. And he said, we should not all sleep, but we should be changed. Now, what I've given you this morning, I've dumped a lot of stuff on you. <laughs> I mean, I've just flown right through it and just, you know, rapid fire. And some of this stuff uh, we'll cover again in the future. We'll come at it from a different direction. It's always good to approach something from different ways. It really is. Uh, you get a better perspective sometimes because we have a tendency to pigeonhole stuff and, and get it all like a, a mule with blinders and, uh, and, and, and just uh, if it doesn't fit exactly the way you had it figured out, you can't understand it. But truth, folks, is not relevant. Truth is absolute. Yeah, it's not relevant truth. It's not my truth and your truth. It's the truth. <laughs> I believe it, you believe it. That's what we're dealing with. So to me, the religion of the Antichrist uh, incorporates these five things. There may be more going on here. You know, I'm not, this, I don't believe it's exhaustive, but this is what I see from all the study and time we've put into it. And uh, it's been a rewarding thing for me, and what it's done for me is opened up a lot of doors because I, there's some evident areas that I want to pursue. For example, this, this German, I definitely want to see what he has to say about some things. And the reason, I'm, the reason I do is because Henry Ford you know, the Ford. I drove a Ford, Ford into work in, in here today. All right. Henry Ford published a newspaper in, uh, in uh, Michigan, uh, Dearborn, wasn't it? Dearborn? Somewhere up in there. And it was called, talking about the international Jew. And he based his assessment of the Jew on the learned protocols of Zion, which showed up in the later, latter part of the 1800s. The Protocols of Zion is a very controversial book. Say, so why is it controversial? It's controversial, number one, as to whether it's genuine, the origins of it. And then it's controversial, not only of its origins, but of the message in it, because in the message in the Protocols of Zion, they lay out clearly how they intend to rule the world and bring the Gentile masses under their, under their control. And uh, Adolf Hitler was fully aware of the Protocols of Zion. And it's one of the reasons that he set up his uh, 
Treblinka and Buchenwald and Belsen Belsen and Auschwitz and all those places over there in Poland where they, where they murdered uh, millions of Jews. So it's going to be very interesting. I had to lay it down for a couple of days because there's too much work to be done. You can't do, spend with so much time in a book. But I'm very interested. He wrote that book when he was 26 years old. That's quite remarkable for a 26-year-old to know that much. It really is for a 26-year-old. But anyway, he was very smart, no question about it. And uh, I'm going to see what he has to say. Well, I've only got about five minutes left. Anybody have any questions or observations or anything you'd like to add to what I've said? Uh, because I certainly don't believe I know it all. I've just got a bunch of stuff here. Yes, sir. I've seen more coexist bumper stickers. They're everywhere, aren't they, brother? They will coexist with anything except someone that doesn't coexist the way coexist. That's what that means. <laughs> they won't coexist with you if you don't coexist the way they want to coexist. Their definition of coexist and your definition of coexist is entirely two different things. It's semantics full blown right in your face. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, brother. I believe it. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir, he's coming. Hallelujah to God. That's, that's our hope. That's our blessed hope. I can't change this world. I'm not going to save it. I'd like to see him come today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, brother. That is. Well, when we, next week we start on the Jews, and when we do, that's going to play an important part in it, the root race theory and eugenics and all this stuff. I, I threw out about uh, Margaret Sanger and all that. That's just that's just kind of, you know. Oh, it's growing. Big. Big time. Yes, sir. You, have, you always ask yourself this question. Why is it that now something like that's happening? Yes, sir. The uh, one that was brother's talking about is the, it's called the Tetrad. I read John Hattie's book. In the last 500 years, it's happened four times. It happened uh, 1493 94 after the Spanish Inquisition, the Jews were let go. It happened after the Holocaust ended. It happened after the Six Day War. And then it's happened right so now. So there's always some kind of an historical event that's associated with a blood, with a blood moon. It, it, What well, does it starts on the specific day? Passover. Passover. Well, Passover's in the spring. Tabernacles is in. Uh, so it runs that period. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that, that's that's very interesting. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. There's three Fridays and thirteenths in this year. Is that right? One in February, one this month, and one only in November. Okay. Three of them in this year. I don't know I don't normally hadn't looked at that. What what how many normally show up in a year? But uh, that's quite a few. Friday the thirteenth. Yes, sir. Three thirteenth and thirty nine. The old testament. <laughs> 
I hadn't heard that. Well, I knew that, but I hadn't heard the 31339. That's true. That's how many books you got. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, amen. I mean, well, gamatria, that's what they call that. Gamatria is the study of numbers as they relate to as events and people and so forth. It's no joke. That's a reality because the, the gamatria of the Lord's name is 888. The last year was the number, uh, the largest number of volcanoes and then the largest number of volcanoes in the history of the world. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Applies now, doesn't it? Wars and rumors of wars. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I have a word of prayer and let you go. Now, next week, Lord willing, you start with the Jews, and you'll be surprised at how they uh, uh, they connect with a lot of this stuff that we're talking about this morning. Uh, first, we'll get a, we'll get into it and get us the definition of what's going on. All right, let's pray. Brother uh, uh, Owen, dismiss us, please. Father, we want to thank you for the study of your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we're not in darkness and that they should come upon us as a thief. Lord, that you've revealed yourself in your word and revealed those things that we need to know. Father, we thank you for that truth. We ask you that you come in this service this morning and manifest yourself in whatever way you see fit. God, you know each heart in this place. You know our needs. 